of St. Gregory Nazianzen, bishop, confessor, doctor, and father of the church. Epistle from the book of Ecclesiasticus. The just will give his heart to resort early to the Lord that made him, and he will pay, pray in the sight of the Most High. He will open his mouth in prayer and will make supplication for his sins. For if, if it shall please the great Lord, he will fill him with the spirit of understanding, and he will pour forth the words of his wisdom as showers. And in his prayer, he will confess to the Lord, and he will direct his counsel and of his knowledge, and in his secrets shall he meditate. He shall show, he shall show forth the discipline he hath learned, and shall glory in the law of the covenant of the Lord. Many shall praise his wisdom, and it shall never be forgotten. The memory of him shall not depart away, and his name shall be in request from generation to generation. Nations shall declare him, nations shall declare his wisdom, and the church shall show forth his praise. Continuation of the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. At that time Jesus said to his disciples, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt lose its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is good for nothing any more but to be cast out and to be trodden on by men. You are the light of the world. A city seated on a mountain cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but upon a candlestick, that it may shine to all that are in the house. So let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father, who is in heaven. Do not think that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For amen, I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall not pass of the law, till all be fulfilled. He therefore that shall break one of these least commandments, and shall so teach men, shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But he that shall do and teach, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Seated. Father and Son, Holy Ghost, Amen. 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 Father, Doctor of the Church, and also Bishop. So we'll listen to some of the facts of his life to help us in this battle that we are living in, some sheer spiritual battle, to keep the faith strong. St. Gregory, who on account of his great knowledge and sacred science, is surnamed the Theologian, was born in Naziazen in the year of our Lord 300. His father, whose name was also Gregory, his mother, Nona, his brother, Caesarius, and Gorgonia, his sister, are all honored as saints in the Catholic Church. At Athens, where St. Gregory devoted himself to study, he became acquainted with St. Basil, who had made his home there with the same intention, and very quickly became close friends, as both were virtuous and diligent. They secluded themselves <clears throat> from all frivolous young men, shunned gaming, idleness, and other vices of youth, 
contemplating rather only piety and knowledge. They knew of only two roads, one which led to school and the other to the church. After having finished his studies, <clears throat> Basil returned to his home, but Gregory remained and studied eloquence, in which he was, in after years, unsurpassed in his speech and sermons. At that time also, Julian studied at Athens, who afterwards became emperor and was called the apostate. In regard to the manners and behavior of this prince, St. Gregory said at that time, quote, Oh, what a monster the Roman Empire nourishes in its bosom. End of quote. At the same time, he predicted that if Julian should ever wear the imperial crown, he would become the great enemy and persecutor of Christendom, which unhappily became true. After several years, St. Gregory left Athens and returned to his native place. One day while studying, he was overtaken by sleep, and it appeared to him that he saw two beautiful virgins who came as if wishing to speak to him. And he asked who they were and what they, were, what they desired. One of us, they answered, is chastity, the other wisdom. God has sent us to be your friends and remain constantly with you." End of quote. And his life proved that this vision was no empty dream. Gregory preserved his chastity inviolable and was endowed by the Almighty with such wisdom that on account of it, he became celebrated throughout the whole world. Great men, among whom was St. Jerome himself, often traveled many miles to hear him speak. Having been a ordained priest, he went secretly to St. Basil, who had retired to the desert of Pontus. There they lived in the greatest harmony, but, but at the same time in the greatest rigor, occupied only in prayer and in studying the Holy Scriptures. After a lapse of some years, St. Gregory returned again to his home to bring back to the, true, to the true faith his father, who, not out of wickedness, but rather out of simplicity and ignorance, had been de deluded by the Arians. Gregory happily extricated him from his error and brought him to the true faith. Meanwhile, Basil became Bishop of Caesarea and most earnestly requested Gregory to take the small bishopric of Sassima, as the far spreading heresy demanded a strong opposition. Gregory allowed himself to be prevailed upon and accepted the see and the diocese. When, however, another one came who asserted that the office was his, he, play, he, he gave place to him and retired. Then they wished him afterwards to take charge of the church at Nazianzum, but he arranged matters in such a manner that they chose someone else. Gregory, however, did not succeed so well in Constantinople. He had gone there to oppose the heretics who had filled the whole city with their poison to defend the Catholic faith and to teach its doctrines to the, to the people there. And after he had labored there some time with great success, Peter, Patriarch of, of Alexandria, nominated him Patriarch of Constantinople. And Gregory was obliged to take this heavy burden. All his thoughts were now directed to exterminate heresy and restore the ancient prestige of the church. The Catholics had at that time only one church where they assembled. The heretics haven't taken possession of all the others in the city. St. Gregory, however, so brought it about that the newly chosen emperor, Theodosius, gave 
came, to, came himself to Constantinople and gave the cathedral back to the Catholics, although the heretics opposed it with all their power. And this enraged the latter to such a degree that they hired a villain to assassinate the patriarch. The saint was sick in bed when the murderer came under the pretext of visiting him in his room. As he, however, was alone with him and therefore had every opportunity of committing the crime, God suddenly changed his heart and falling at the feet of the saint, he confessed his wicked intention and asked forgiveness. And the saint said the following words, quote, May God, who protected me, forgive you. I ask you nothing but that you forsake your heresy. End of quote. Much more had he to suffer from the heretics, but it in no wise slackened his zeal. The Catholics also gave him just cause of complaint. Among the bishops assembled in council, a dispute arose concerning the, the validity of Gregory's election. And the same represented to them that he had not in any manner whatsoever sought the office, but that he had been forced upon him against his desire. Perceiving, however, that all were not satisfied with his explanation, and fearing that the peace of the church might be materially endangered to the detriment of the whole Christian community, St. Gregory arose from that meeting and addressing, addressing the assemblance in the following manner, he said, quote, Dear colleagues and joint shepherds of the flock of Christ, it would be very unbecoming to your dignity should you, whose office it is to exhort others to peace, become disunited among yourselves. Am I the cause of your discord? Behold, I am not better than the prophet Jonah. Cast me therefore into the sea, and the tempest will be calmed. Although I am innocent of your charges, I will suffer without a murmur that, una that unanimity may be restored among you. And a quote. And after having thus spoken calmly and sweetly, he took leave of all present and went to the emperor, whom he acquainted with his resolution to leave Constantinople. Now the emperor at first refused his consent, but the saint knew so well how to re represent to him his reasons that he at last gave him the desired permission. He immediately made all the necessary preparations for his departure, but once more ascended the pulpit of his Episcopal church, the cathedral, and in one last discourse, one last sermon, took leave of all the assembled faithful, as also of all the other churches, hospitals, and asylums of the city. Those who had frequently complained of his sermons because he un un hesitantly denounced their vices he said, quote, Now joyfully clap your hands and cry that the bad talkative tongue will cease to strike you. Yes, it will cease, but the hand still remains, and pen and ink must in future sustain the combat. Finally, he admonished them to, to all of them to lead a Christian life included a sermon with these words, quote, I exhort you, my dear children, to keep my instructions in your hearts. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ remain with you all. Amen. And how deeply affected all his hearers were was plainly perceived by their tears and emotion. Well had the reason to be grieved, for they had possessed in St. Gregory a most tender father for their knee wi widows, and orphans, an invincible protector of their faith, a teacher from whom God had gifted with unusual wisdom, a careful, never-weary pastor, 
an almost perfect model of all virtues. And they tried in every possible way to prevent his leaving, but he was not to be persuaded to change his resolution, but went on board the ship, which was ready to set sail and return to his home. On his arrival, he settled himself upon his parental estate, Arianzum, with the intention of, of then passing the remainder of his life in solitude and in the exercise of virtue. This intention he carried out and prayers and devout meditation were his greatest comfort until failing health, owing to his excessive labor, besides old age and sickness, kept him for the greater part of the time in bed. Sometimes, however, he took the pen in hand and wrote several works to, con to confute the doctrine of the heretics and to strengthen and confirm the Catholics. God permitted that the holy man, who had lived until now so pious and a pure a life, should endure most fearful temptations from the evil one. Constant calling on God, austere fasting and prayers, reading devout books and severe study were the weapons he used against the enemy of man, Satan, and he always conquered. The Most High also permitted that some men, envious and devoid of conscience, should, should calumniate the saint everywhere and even falsely accuse him of some great crimes to the bishop at Tiania. The holy man was not angry, but while defending his honor, prayed God to bestow his grace upon his enemies and to pardon them. Omitting much that might still be related to, of this saint, we will only mention one instance of his solicitude to avoid sin and to do penance. He thought that he had spoken in a certain affair more than was necessary. In his life, when he examined his conscience, and thus punished himself by remaining 40 days without uttering a single word to anyone. Just one example of what the saint did. At length he expired happily in the 90th, 90th year of his age, having labored and suffered much more for the honor of the Almighty and protection of the true Church. And the old Catholic Encyclopedia summarizes his, his written works with the following. St. Gregory's claims to rank as one of the greatest theologians of the early Church are based, apart from his reputation among his contemporaries, and the verdict of history in his regard, chiefly on the five great, quote, theological discourses, which he delivered at Constantinople in the course of the year of our Lord, 380. In estimating the scope and the value of these famous utterances, or sermons, it is necessary to remember that what was the religious condition of Constantinople when Gregory, at the urgent request of, of Basil and of many other bishops, and of the sorely, sorely tried Catholics of the Eastern capital, went thither to undertake the spiritual charge of the faithful. It was less as an administrator or an organizer than as a man of saintly life and of or oracle gifts famous throughout the Eastern Church that Gregory was asked and consented to undertake his difficult mission. And he had to exercise those gifts in combat, combating not one, but numerous heresies which had been dividing and desolating Constantinople for many years. Arianism, in every form and degree, incipient, moderate, and extreme, was of course the great enemy. But St. Gregory also had to wage war against the Apollinarian teaching, which denied the humanity of Christ as well as against the contrary tendency, later developed into Nestorianism, which distinguished between the Son of Mary and the Son of God as two distinct and separate personalities. He also had to fight this heresy. A saint first and a theologian afterwards, St. Gregory, in one of his early sermons at Anastasia, insisted on the principle of reverence in treating of the mysteries of faith, 
which by the way, it was a principle entirely ignored by his Aryan opponents. And he also insisted also on the purity of life, an example which all who dealt with these high manners must show if must show forth if their teaching was to be effectual. In the first and second of the five discourses, he develops these two principles at some length, urging in language of wonderful beauty and force the necessity for all who would know God aright to lead a supernatural life and to approach a so sublime a study with a mind pure and free from sin. The third discourse on the Son is devoted to defense of the Catholic doctrine of the Trinity and a demonstration of its consonance with the primitive doctrine of the unity of God. The external existence of the Son and, the, and Spirit are insisted upon <clears throat> together with their dependence on the Father as origin or principle. And the divinity of the Son is argued from Scripture against the Arians, whose misunderstanding of various Scripture texts is exposed and confuted. In the fourth discourse, on the same subject, the union of the Godhead and manhood in Christ is uh, in Christ incarnate is set forth, and luminously proved from Scripture and reason. And the final and fifth discourse on the Holy Ghost is directed partly against the Macedonian heresy, which denied altogether the divinity of the Holy Ghost, and also against those who reduced the third person of the Trinity to a mere impersonal energy of the Father. St. Gregory in reply to the contention that the divinity of the Holy Ghost is not expressed in, in Scripture, quotes and comments on several passages which teach the doctrine by implication, adding that the full manifestation of this great truth was intended to be gradual, following on the revelation of the divinity on the Son, of the Son. It is to be noted that St. Gregory nowhere formulates the doctrine of the double procession, although in his luminous exposition of the Trinitarian doctrine, there are many passages which seem to anticipate the fuller teaching of the quincunque vote. No summary, not even a faithful verbal translation can give any adequate idea of the combined subtlety and lucidity of thought and rare beauty of expression of these wonderful discourses, in which, as one of his French critics truly observes, Gregory, quote, has summed up and closed, closed the controversy of a whole century. The best evidence of their value and power lies in the fact that for 14 centuries, they have been a gold mine. These teachings have been a gold mine whence the greatest theologians of Christendom have drawn treasures of wisdom to illustrate and support their own teaching on the deepest mysteries of the Catholic faith. St. Gregory Nazianzen, pray for us. Amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.